So you get the picture here. His father-in-law has chased him out of his town. He's coming with all of his flock, all of his servants, all of his, his wives, his children. And he is coming and he's heading towards hometown because the Lord had spoken to him and said, hey, you go back home and it'll go well with you. Okay, But now his brother, who tried to kill him 20 years or so beforehand, is headed toward him with 400 men. Not with all of his family to, hey, let's have a nice family reunion in the desert, but with 400 men, like an army. So Jacob divides everybody into two companies. So, okay, well, he can't kill all of us at the same time anyway. And let me take all of these valuables. Okay, and first we'll send the camels. And second we'll send the rams. And third we'll send the other stuff. And so in these... These companies, these droves will go and the servant will go and say to Esau and he says, who are you? What are you doing? Oh, well, this is Jacob's stuff and it's a present for you. And, and he's right he's right back there. Hopefully to just appease him and settle him down. Jacob is fearful. He's fearing for his life and he has good reason to. Jacob now is realizing he's lived up to his name. He is a dirty, rotten scoundrel. He is a deceiver. He is a a heel catcher. And now it's time to pay up. Now it's time to face what he has done in his life. That's where he is at. He can't go back. And he's wondering what's going to happen when he goes forward. Verse 22 says, He arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabuk, which is a stream, and he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. So in other words, okay, gets up in the middle of the night and says, I've divided everybody into two companies, but now I've got to take my wife and kids and I've got to set them somewhere else so that they are safe. That's what he's doing. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, meaning Jacob, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What's your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. And then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. And so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shank. Weird? Who's he wrestling with? It just says, well, he wrestled with a man. And most Bibles uh, make man uppercase, and all of the pronouns talking about him, uppercase meaning this is the angel of the Lord. And Jacob's response to this would confirm that. Hey, I'm renaming this place. And what does he name it? Well, literally, it's named the face of God. The face of God. Because I have seen God face to face and I'm still alive. Because there is uh, scriptural precedent and idea for the fact that no man can see God face to face and live. And Jacob's going, well, I saw the messenger of the Lord. I saw the Lord. I saw the angel of the Lord face to face, and I wrestled with him. Now, we could spend, boy, uh, the rest of today and into this evening talking about, well, how does this work? What does it really mean? What are the theological implications and all of that? And we're not going to do that this morning. But I want what I want you to think about here is at the heart of the story is this is the point at which Jacob is changed. He's cried out to God in the in the first part of this chapter and said, Lord, you said you would take care of me. I'm not worthy of it, but I'm asking you to take care of me. And he's wrestling with this angel of God, representing wrestling with God. The angel says to him. 
you're getting a new name. I'm not going to call you deceiver anymore, but rather we'll call you Israel. Now, Israel is an interesting word. El is God. Israel can be translated power of God, power with God, ruled by God, ruled ruling with God. And people translate it different ways that way. But it speaks of the power of God. And, and what the angel says to him is, it says, hey, look, I'm changing your name because something's happened to you. What happened to him? Well, he got his hip knocked out of joint. So much so that he limped from then on. Had to lean on a staff in order to support himself because his, his hip is out of joint now. He's been broken. Jacob's been broken. Physically, that getting the hip knocked out of joint is representing what has happened inside. And that is, he's come to a place of brokenness. He's come to the place of giving up. He's come to the place of, I'm not going to depend upon my own scheming anymore. But now, he's got to lean on the power of God. That's where he has to find his support. Israel. And so you will find throughout the Old Testament, in the prophets, in the Psalms, various places, you will find different places where it will speak about Jacob and Israel and use those names at different times. But they're two different people. Jacob was the deceiver. Israel is the one who now is broken and is going to lean on God. And what happens is when he comes to see his brother, his brother just loves on him. Says, hey, I'm glad you're back. And they celebrate. And all the fear that Jacob had of getting what he deserved, God had taken care of. He had taken care of Esau's heart enough that Esau was not out to kill him. God had taken care of that. Up to this time in Jacob's life, he was scheming and conniving. He was making things happen. I can make things happen. I can direct what I need to do in my life. I can direct this or that. I, man, I can make this happen. You could probably make some things happen too, can't you? But Jacob came to the place of realizing that where all of his scheming and conniving was taking him was not a good place. And now he's broken. And now his name is Israel. And this is an amazing picture of the change of a man. And it is a picture of the new birth in Jesus Christ. Because you see, what Jesus said was He said to Nicodemus, He said, you know what? Unless a man or woman be born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. What happens in Christ is coming to a place of not just having a lot of knowledge about God, not just doing the things of God, hanging out with other people who are Christians, listening to K-Love. That's, that's not it. All those things are great. But it's possible to do all of those things and not be changed. Not be a changed person. Not be, as Jesus said, be born again. Because it's a radical change. Paul says it's so radical that old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what the life is for a believer in Jesus Christ. Say, Pastor, I knew that. I got saved 25 years ago. Could you move on to something else here? No. And the reason for that is because we need to remember that. We need to recognize that. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And getting back to the psalm, why do, what connections does this have to this psalm except these two names? Well, a lot. It has a lot. Because notice, he's praising God. Praise the name of God. Hey, servants of the Lord, praise God. Praise God. Why? 
for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself. Wait a minute. Jacob, that's the dirty, rotten scoundrel. That's the deceiver. That's the supplanter. That's the heel catcher. And God chose him. I'm kind of slight of build. Up until the time I was in ninth grade, I didn't break 100 pounds. I since have broken it plus quite well. Thank you very much. But I was usually the shortest kid in the class. It was not the guy that when you had pickup gains of sports was not the first one picked. Okay? Was usually down in that negotiation phase at the end. You know where, okay, well if you take him, I guess we'll take him. So that, you know, kind of evens the badness out on both teams. Right? If you were looking for someone to hire and you were interviewing people, one guy came in with a you know, doctorate from MIT. Somebody else came in from a, with a doctorate from CMU. The third one came in and said, well, I have my doctorate from the School of Hard Knocks. I just spent the last 20 years in prison for armed robbery. But I feel like I would be really good to be the treasurer of your company. Okay, that wouldn't be the resume that would rise to the top of the stack, would it? Except for God. Except for God. Paul says it this way. He's chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Jesus chooses those who are not equipped. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And so whether you are in that place in your life of saying, I I just... I just don't feel worthy enough. I don't feel equipped enough. I don't feel knowledgeable enough to do what I think I should be doing, but I I can't do that. I'm, I'm having delusions of grandeur here and thinking I could do that. Maybe not. Maybe God is really calling you to that. And you're just recognizing the fact that if you follow through on that calling, that means you're going to have to depend 100% on Him because you can't do that. You don't have the strength or intelligence or knowledge or whatever it is to be able to do that. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe the enemy is keeping it on you that you're not worthy of it. God chooses the foolish. God chooses a deceiver and spend some time working on him until he's broken. And now, now he's ready to raise his 12 kids and prepare the nation of Israel to happen. This guy becomes the one the nation to this day is named after. How about that? How'd you like to have a whole nation named after you? But look at who he is. Look who God chooses to do those things. It is in God's strength. That's who He chooses. He's chosen Jacob for Himself. Israel for His special treasure. You see, He chooses us. Then He makes us into His special treasure by His grace and by His mercy. 